Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Alvaro Santos, a professor of law at Georgetown University and faculty director of CAROLA, the Center for the Advancement of the Rule of Law in the Americas. Uh, welcome to our fourth webinar in our series, The Americas in Times of COVID-19. Uh, today's session is the future of migration in the Americas, and we have a wonderful lineup of speakers who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, in this webinar, we will discuss possible scenarios for migration in the Americas in the next few years. Some of the questions that we want uh, our speakers to, to address and also you to think about uh, include, can we expect a new surge of migration to the US as a result of the economic crisis in the region produced by COVID-19? Uh, what do recent trends of the US-Mexico border tell us about the situation on the ground. Um, we're also a week away from the election in the United States. How would the US respond to new migration pressures under a Trump two or Biden one administrations? The Trump administration rhetoric on migration and its policies have raised many concerns and garnered a lot of criticism. But there were also important continuities with the Obama administration's immigration policies, particularly regarding rates and deportations and deterring migration from Central America. Is the US migration policy likely to change with the election? What is the likelihood of a more regional approach to migration that includes investment and economic relief in source countries? This is something that uh, the new government of Mexico and the governments of Central America had proposed. Are there any new opportunities on that front? Uh, can the U what can the US, Mexico, and other countries in the region do, including at the borders, to better regulate migration flows and reduce the insecurity and violence that migrants face? So these are all questions that seem very pressing, pressing and that we're uh, really delighted to have our speakers uh, comment on and share their in insights about. Uh, the session will last uh, one hour and a half uh, with the last hour, with the last half an hour exclusively for Q&A. And we have invited speakers with deep knowledge and experience in international migration, and we're really grateful and delighted to have them join us. I'll introduce them now in the order that they will speak. So first we have Professor Catherine Donato, who holds the Donald G. Herzberg Chair in International Migration and is director of the Institute for the Study of International Migration in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Prior to joining Georgetown, she was in the faculty of Vanderbilt and Rice Universities. She has examined many research questions related to migration, including the economic consequences of U.S. migration policy, health effects of Mexico-U.S. migration, immigrant parent involvement in schools in New York, Chicago, and Nashville, deportation and its effects for immigrants, the Great Recession and its consequences for Mexican workers, and gender and migration. Her recent book is Gender and International Migration from Slavery to Present, published by the Russell Sage Foundation with Donna Gabacha at the University of Toronto. Uh, in July 2016, she published with Douglas Messe, uh, Undocumented Migration in a Global Economy, 21st Century Globalization and Illegal Migration, which was a special issue of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. I should uh, um, note that I'm presenting highlights of the bios of our very accomplished speakers. So if I'm missing something they think is important, I've invited them uh, to say so. But uh, given the time constraints, I'm just going to do quicker uh, bio readings. Next, we have um, Tracy Horan who is the Interim Director of Education and Advocacy at the Kino Border Initiative. Uh, she coordinates the programs offered by the Kino Border Initiative in the United States, which includes the development and delivery of curricula that is attentive to both the Catholic social tradition and the contemporary realities of border and migration policies 
as well as the development and realization of an advocacy policy and plan. Uh, I should also note that uh, Tracy hosted a group of uh, faculty and staff at Georgetown this last January when we did a visit to the border uh, and got to know the amazing work that the Kino Border Initiative is doing both in uh, Nogales, Mexico, in Sonora and Nogales, Arizona. So we're very thankful to Tracy uh, for uh, receiving us and also for the work she's, she's been doing. Next, we have Miriam Hassan, who is an immigration specialist of the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights and senior fellow with the Tower Center for Political Studies at Southern Methodist University. She was a senior consultant, consultant with the Inter-American Development Bank, where she led a major research project on international migration in Central America, Mexico, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. She has held research and scholarly position at DEMOS, Ideas in Action, the Migration Policy Institute, the University of Pennsylvania, Rogers University, and the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, she's the author of numerous policy reports, journal articles, book chapters, and blogs, on topics related to international migration and refugees in the Americas, migration and development, immigration integration in the US, Latino politics and US-Mexico relations. And last but not least, we have Andrew Seeley, who has been the president of the Migration Policy Institute since August, 2017, working on improving immigration and integration policies through fact-based research opportunities for learning and dialogue and the development of new ideas to address, address complex policy questions. Prior to joining the Migration Policy Institute, he spent 17 years at the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson Center, where he founded the center's Mexico Institute and later served as vice president for programs and executive vice president. He has also worked as staff in the U.S. Congress and on development and migration programs in Tijuana, Mexico. His research focuses on migration globally with a special emphasis on immigration policies in Latin America and the U.S. He's the author of several books, including most recently, Vanishing Frontiers, The Forces Driving Mexico and the United States Together, and What Should Think, what should think Tanks Do? A Strategic Guide to Policy Impact. He's been an adjunct professor at both John Hopkins University and George Washington University, and was a visiting scholar at El Colegio de Mexico. So thank you to our speakers. And we're gonna start first with Catherine Donato. Thank you, Alvaro, and thank you for organizing this panel um, and to all the speakers. So I am going to make three broad points. Um, and so I'll go into the first one. The first is that most US focused migration is through Mexico and not from Mexico. The error of large scale single men migrating from Mexico to the US for work has ended. Uh, and that ended on or around the um, uh, 20, 2007, 2008. Uh, since then, Mexico US migration has been at about net zero, in some years net negative. Uh, it's not as if people are not coming in from Mexico, but uh, that they're being, uh, their numbers are being offset by returns, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, uh, also, uh, estimates suggest that more than 500,000 US citizen children are now living in Mexico, having returned with their parents who are Mexican born or returned as part of mixed status families. These families made difficult decisions to return uh, in light of the enforcement policies in the US. And of course, right now, many in Mexico uh, are thinking about how well will these children integrate into Mexican society. Um, also related is that uh, instead of the Mexican born um, migrating to the US in, in very large numbers. Now many are transiting through Mexico, um, most from northern the Northern Triangle countries, although others too, including Cubans and Haitians and Venezuelans, Cam Cameroonians, Nigerians. Um, several years ago, that transit took place by foot and on trains, right from the Northern uh, Triangle uh, countries. 
Uh, now it's taking place by foot and on bus, um, or sometimes planes as well, internal to Mexico. Uh, and some people are traveling in very large groups, as we've heard in the last few years. Most are seeking asylum or protection, hoping for a threat-free life in the United States. Now, in, use, in recent years, the many asylum seekers at the border have led to policies and practices uh, that have returned um, applicants to Mexico to wait their turn. Uh, and I, I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that, that return, remain in Mexico uh, program from uh, Tracy, as well as probably from a few others. But that wait time could vary and varies from a few months uh, to um, almost a year of last time I was at the border. Um, few services for, Mexi for migrants who are waiting in Mexico, in Mexican border towns. I'm sure Tracy will talk a bit about what Kino does in that, in that context. Um, there are some shelters, but there are a few of them. There are volunteer efforts like Kino. Um, uh, but that, my point here is that migrants are ripe for predators. Um, uh, and uh, as they wait, the situations are difficult, threatening, resource thin, and there are makeshift camps in some places like in Matamoros and elsewhere. Um, so that's point number one. People are not traveling, migrating from Mexico, but they're migrating through Mexico. Point number two is that across Latin America, more than 5 million Venezuelans have been displaced um, uh, because of political turmoil, socioeconomic instability, and violence. This is a humanitarian crisis that represents the largest displaced displacement in recent history in Latin America. Most uh, Venezuelans, four out of five million, have remained in South America, with Colombia hosting the largest number, follow it, followed by other countries that also house many Venezuelans, Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, Peru, and uh, Argentina. So the challenges here are great given the numbers of uh, Venezuelans that are on the move, and, and broadly speaking, the numbers of people um, seeking refuge are growing, um, and uh, you know, trying to evade threats rather than only seeking employment. So meeting the needs of this population is neither easy nor straightforward. Point number three, is that COVID-19 impacts are substantial. Um, at the Mexico-US border, the Center for Disease Control, as well as the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, there are now orders at the border that prohibit non-essential travel, and asylum seekers are non-essential in this definition. So they're being expelled back to Mexico or to their countries of origin, and that includes even unaccompanied minor children or unaccompanied migrant children are being expelled back. Rates of infection uh, uh, are very high. Of course, they're very high in the US, they're very high in Latin America, led by Brazil, but now many countries exceed 1 million confirmed COVID cases. And <clears throat> broadly speaking, many national governments um, uh, are doing, are not doing enough to contain the virus. <clears throat> And uh, migrants who are especially likely to live in crowded conditions and in congregate settings like shelters will likely become infected. And of course, it hasn't helped that in many countries in Latin America, leaders have embraced unproven treatments um, that are not evidence-based. Um, the impacts will be significant and long-lasting of COVID. The World Bank, for example, forecasts in June uh, that GDP in Latin America and the Car Caribbean as a whole will contract by 7.2% by the end of this year. Before the pandemic, the bank had projected GDP growth that was positive at 1.8%. So given that poverty, violence, and climate change are the biggest motivators for new, and I'll, I'll define that as first trip migration, COVID impacts will likely worsen <clears throat> these conditions and indirectly and eventually push many more people to leave their homes. Um, I'll stop there and come back in later on policy. Thanks very much, Catherine. Uh, let me now move to Tracy. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'll just mention briefly um, about KBI, the work that we do. We're here in, in ambos Nogales, so both sides, Nogales, Arizona and Sonora, Mexico, and we focus on humanitarian aid, education, research, and advocacy. And so each day, actually this morning, they're um, preparing the food right now for folks who are arriving. Um, we still have a lot of migrants who are here waiting. The majority of them at this time are waiting for international protection, for asylum, um, without sort of an end in sight to that wait. So I think to kind of echo a little bit of what Kathy said, what we're seeing, it really shows putting that um, enforcement only and putting the pressure on other countries to do the work of the US in, in safe um, processing of migrants. And so, um, you know, the wait times that we've seen last year in the summer, uh, people that were waiting under metering, which, you know, they presented a port of entry and then were told, you know, we don't have the capacity to process you at this time. The wait time was around a month. Um, back in March, when the CDC order came into play, when people, when asylum processing essentially stopped at all ports of entry, the wait time had increased already to about four months that people were waiting when they originally arrived. So now at this time, we have a lot of people who they'll come to the Comodoro and say, I'm celebrating my one year anniversary of being in Nogales. Um, just shocked, never thinking that they would spend that much time here in Nogales, a place that they've never known of. Um, and so there's a lot of implications of that, right? People coming in and staying in a place that they really thought would be a, a temporary experience now being there for a year. So things like education, students having access to schools, um, jobs is really tough because as Kathy was saying, a lot of folks are, are coming from other countries. So if they're foreign nationals in Mexico and they don't have a Mexican ID, they don't have access to a lot of jobs. And so trying to navigate that system and then being able to provide for their families after you know months. Often, we also have a number of folks that are relying on family members in the US. And so if those folks have lost their jobs because of COVID, that means that they don't have that support to rely on either. So a lot of those other connections that are branching out are also impacting migrants as well. Um, another way we see sort of these the trends of people's experience now during COVID, a lot of folks traveling through Mexico have spent significant amount of time in southern Mexico being processed. So we have a lot of Venezuelans and Cubans coming through who might have been detained for, um, I've heard someone say up to 100 days in Chiapas in a state in southern Mexico before they were able to get their paperwork and be released to travel north. And so um, then on top of those you know, months that they've been waiting have an additional wait when they get to the border, puts more strain on them. Um, we've seen increased desperation in general with folks with the dismantling of asylum systems in the US. And so um, this idea of prevention through deterrence, you know, the more that we put obstacles and take away the rights and impede the due process of asylum seekers, people seeking protection, um, the more people will give up. It's sort of the, the theory, which we know plays out in people living through dangerous scenarios. And so, um, you know, in the past, we saw this mostly with economic migrants who would take the risk of crossing through the desert so that they could um, find work or find opportunities in the US. Now we're seeing that prevention through deterrence impact extending to families who are fleeing persecution as well. And so um, we have families that have been waiting for months at the port of entry to seek international protection and, you know, really can't stand it anymore. And so they, you know, even families that have tried to present at a port of entry with health risks, with um, threats that they're receiving in Mexico or having experienced kidnapping, um, even when they present at a port of entry with those extensive circumstances, they're still being denied. And so they're taking that option of trying to cross between ports of entry through the desert. And so part of that that we're seeing is we're on track for the highest number of uh, migrant deaths in Arizona that we've seen in over a decade because more and more people are, are taking that risk. Um, and so really we're, the US is putting this risk the responsibility for viable, safe migration processing off on other countries, and we're seeing um, we're seeing the results of that. And an additional concern for us at the Kino Border Initiative is that, um, in addition to putting off those responsibilities through things like remain in Mexico and asylum metering, um, where people are having to wait longer in Mexico, we're also seeing that a lot of the work of processing asylum seekers and migrants 
is being put in the hands of folks who are not trained to do it. And so particularly the resources being funneled to Border Patrol and to CBP and them having the responsibility of doing fear assessments or encountering folks who are seeking protection, who usually should go through an asylum officer, and then all of the abuses that come along with that. And so, um, and with sort of the, the current environment, those folks in many cases feel emboldened um, to take on that role and, and mistreat migrants. And so we at KBI, um, often, you know, we have people that have been returned under Title 42 expulsions who are returned to Nogales and we do an intake process with them. And so we have filed um, 10 formal complaints with Department of Homeland Security just since March for people who encountered Border Patrol and requested a fear assessment, expressed their fear both of returning to Mexico because of torture or um, returning to their country of origin because of persecution and were denied access to that. Um, and really just flagrant abuses within those complaints are included one man from Honduras who was returned here to Nogales, um, had expressed his fear because he had experienced um, threats here. Um, the night that he was returned, he didn't have a place to stay, slept outside, and then was attacked by the gangs um, and kidnapped and showed up at our um, migrant aid center the next day bleeding from the head. And so we see the direct impacts of the US refusing responsibility and just denying international law. Um, another example, a Nicaraguan man who tried to cross through the desert to, to request asylum, who because he spent seven days in the desert and ran out of food and water, was hospitalized for over a week and had, um, had to receive extensive treatment. Um, he was actually taken out of the hospital in a wheelchair and returned to Mexico, still in his hospital gown with no shoes on. And so just um, over and over time and again, we see examples of the US just refusing any responsibility, um, any human response to people who are, are fleeing these dangers. Um, and so it's, it's very concerning to us. The other thing in general, we've seen an increase in abuses. Kathy kind of referenced this a little bit. Particularly, we have a lot of Venezuelans and Cubans coming through and um, because of their accent, because of the color of their skin, often they are um, specifically targeted and people assume that they might have access to more resources. And so a number of folks who have had um, somehow someone got a hold of their phone number, called them and extorted them, said that, you know, they, they were going to kidnap a member of their family or that they already had unless they would pay a certain amount of money or that they couldn't stay living where they were unless they would pay an extortion fee. Um, so those things are becoming more and more common, um, robbery and kidnapping, as Kathy mentioned, that people are, are really feeling um, are more vulnerable and they're waiting for longer times. Um, we're also seeing that, um, you know, as we're seeing more militarization in some of the urban areas, which has been going on now for years, but it continues to increase, folks are crossing in smaller towns with less resources. Um, and so that means, you know, there's a couple of small towns in Arizona, um, the most common is Sasabe. So in the past, most deportations went through a, a port like Nogales, where we, you know, there aren't enough beds in our shelters, but at least there are some resources like KBI. Um, but now people are being returned because of this focus on, on quick return, they're being returned through Sasabe, where the resources are very limited. And so it leaves families um, without anywhere to turn rather than coming to a place like Nogales. Um, as far as just the virus itself, I would also say uh, in Arizona, about 50% of the people being released from detention, from detention centers in Arizona are testing positive with the virus. And the response has been really appalling um, because DHS refuses to take any responsibility for testing people and has said that that is not, that's not their role. And so what it means is then the pressure is put on small communities and, and the folks that would be receiving people when, when they're deported um, or when they're released from detention. And so that's obviously a concern for us as we're encountering those folks every day and they're being sent without resources um, to our communities like here in Nogales, Sonora. And so, you know, overall, um, just a general disregard for migrant safety and due process, which we've only seen increase over time, um, is really concerning for us. Um, the blatant disregard for international and US law to protect asylum seekers. Um, the concern is if things continue on this tra trajectory, uh, that people will become more and more desperate um, and we'll see more deaths, we'll see more people making tough decisions and being put in um, dangerous situations. And so 
Um, obviously for us, we would hope for a change in that. We would hope that the U.S. would, would take responsibility and also invest resources in uh, the departments that actually know, have the training to do things like asylum processing um, and asylum officers and folks that can accompany migrants in that process rather than this focus on enforcement only re responses. Thank you, Tracy, for that uh, very vivid and bleak report of what's happening in the in the U.S. border uh, in the area that the Kino Border Initiative is, is working on. Um, Miriam, let me turn to you. First of all, thank you so much and uh, hi everyone. So I thought that my role would be kind of useful if I put some context to, to the debate, especially in view of the presidential election that we are facing. So I just wanted to remind all of us that uh, because part of the, the uh, invitation was to talk about North America. So I wanted to remind that in North America, we have a very important uh, immigration system that exists between Central America, Mexico, and the US. And I wanted to remind uh, people in the audience just what were some of the characteristics of this migration uh, system, which has to do, um, although the origin of migration from Central America was different from Mexico at some point, they kind of came together, uh, what Catherine was mentioning, there was labor migration, and it happened in the context of economic integration between uh, the US and Mexico, but also with Central America. And I wanted to mention that because it is important to remember that this migration happened as the economies of uh, uh, the Northern Triangle countries, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, and Mexico's economy were integrating with the US. So that made also the economies very dependent on, on uh, the US economy. So, which also reminds us of the power that the, and the asymmetry of power that now exists between the US and, and Mexico because of that. So this was also a migration that took place in the context of economic modernization in these countries. And uh, the issue was that it, uh, that produced displacement and produced high, high levels of uh, irregular migration because uh, the, even though there were these economic agreements, there wasn't really a, a play, a, a, the, the possibility of migrants to go uh, to travel legally. So my labor was not contemplated in these uh, um, economic agreements. So uh, as, uh, in this migration system, a significant proportion of the flows have taken place uh, in the, also in the context when the US, on the other hand, was uh, uh, establishing an immigration control system, primarily targeted to Mexico, but then impacted Central America. So as Catherine mentioned, uh, net migration from Mexico now is, is negative. Mexico is not producing new, flow, new flows. Uh, Central American flows continued. They still are, are uh, primarily, I believe, uh, at least until very recently, economic. At least we did a survey with the IDB that came out as a, still the major factor, a very recent survey. Uh, obviously, the nature of the flows have changed, and now we have a lot of uh, families and uh, family units and children. So I just wanted to remind people why uh, in this migration system it impacts uh, particularly Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. These are first generation populations uh, predominantly, not in the case of Mexico. Uh, Mexico is still now the second and third generation are are larger than the first generation, but it is the case of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, where over 50% of the population, uh, the first generation, has been irregular. So that means that the, these groups are very different from the rest of other immigrant groups in the US. And I wanted to remind the audience why the decisions that the US take uh, with regards to migration affects people, especially from the Northern Triangle. I, I will go just I wanted to, to go through the immigration policies of different administrations very fast because I think it will give us elements for the discussion later on in terms of what could we expect, expect from either a Trump or Biden uh, administration, Trump two or Biden administration. It is important to see how there has been a lot of cumulative uh, uh, effects of these policies that has uh, uh, spread through the span of uh, more than two decades. So what the crisis and humanitarian crisis that we are looking at right now really have been accumulating over time. And uh, it is important to remember that because there are things that weren't solved and then the problem became bigger. Uh, so it is important to remember that the problem was still there. So I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, the, the US uh, 
uh, started to pursue a primarily immigration only a control a policy approach starting in, in 1986 through IRCA. It's just important to remember that it started with the penalties of, of, of employers. Then in the 1990s, we have the uh, policies of prevention through deterrence. So we have policies that started to control major urban centers to deter the flows to other areas, thinking that that will control the flows. So the different operations, a, a gatekeeper, I mean, different names of operations, but it, it deviated the flows to dangerous areas. And so that's why we have migration in the desert. And then after 9-11, we have the, what I call the policies of consequences. And that is very important because recently there has been a change and I, will, I mentioned it, but in 2004, uh, the US started with this policy called accelerated renewal which is that any person who had been uh, for two weeks uh, or, or less in the US and uh, within 100 miles of the border could be expelled. This has been changed by the Trump administration, was changed by the Trump administration to, to be all over the, the US and uh, uh, having been two years or less in the US. What, it, that, what this means is that the person can be expelled without having to pass through a judge. So that means that it cancels the due process. Of, 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 of that migrants are entitled to. So the, 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 the effect of that in, in, in at the time was that by 2013, 44 uh, uh, percent of the deportations were carried through this legal tool. So that will show how relevant it could be if we have a Trump to administration. Then uh, another important thing to remember is Operation Streamline, Streamline because that introduced the bans, immigration bans that have impacted the region, which is that uh, if, if you were detained and expelled, you could not come back to the US for three to 10 years, sometimes 20 years. So that is also a thing to remember because a lot of the towns in Mexico and Central America are populated by people who were deported and, and face this uh, no possibility of return. Um, then we have the intersection of the immigration control system with the criminal justice systems. Uh, an important thing to remember is the collaboration uh, the, uh, through 287G the, of the, the Nationality Act, which allow a, a local authorities to collaborate with uh, the, the federal authorities on immigration, and also very important, the incarceration program through which uh, the migrants who were detained for any reason could be uh, uh, re referred to the immigration authorities and be deported. These programs are very important because many of the deportations that we have seen in the past two decades have happened uh, through these tools. So, so just wanted to, to, to remind what happened during the Obama administration, because I think that will allow us to think what will happen with a Biden administration, if there is a, a Biden administration. So in 2011, the Obama administration did try to stop the machinery because it started to be a machinery that produced what uh, brought Obama to be called the deporter in chief. So, so the Obama administration uh, in 2011 issued some memorandums, the mortal memorandums, where they say that they will do a, a only discretion in prosecutions, meaning only those who are criminals will be deported. And also the, the Obama administration introduced DACA in 2012, which is a program for the children uh, of, of migrants who came irregularly to the US. I know that many of you know, but I don't know if everybody in the audience, and it's important to remember it, uh, know about it. Uh, so, so that program allowed them to remain in the US. They still didn't get any specific legal status. They were still like in a limbo, but they could work in the US and they would not be deported. Obama, um, at the end of his administration, tried to extend this program and also add what is called DAPA, which is a program that was for the, the parents of those DACAs, so the children of, of minors who came uh, at a young age in the US. And uh, uh, also, when, when he, uh, uh, Obama also tried to stop the, the secure pro communities programs and the collaboration with uh, immigration authorities. So if we look at the deportation numbers, and I didn't put them here because we don't have much time, just that really reduced the, the, the level of deportations at the end of the Obama administration. Um, so what happened when Trump came to power? 
where he revived this machinery, which I look as like a train, like a steam of a train that is going very, very fast and it's very hard to stop. And then Obama kind of tries to stop it, but it's already there. And what, what uh, Trump does is he uh, introduces everything that existed before. So the, all the, the collaboration between authorities, uh, he reintroduces the secure community program, um, DACA, uh, he tries to cancel DACA. Uh, it, this has been stopped by the court, but it's still uh, in a, an open question, what will happen with these DACA applicants if there is a second Trump administration. Uh, he expanded the accelerated removal process. It was stopped by the courts, but two weeks ago or a week ago, uh, it was reinstated, meaning that people who have been uh, less than two years in the US uh, uh, could be deported without uh, having to pass through a judge. So that means that if there is a, a Trump second administration, we'll have more deportations because of that, because now they'll be able to detain almost uh, everybody who cannot prove that has been uh, two years or less in the US. And also very important for in this migration system uh, for Central America, TPS, temporary protect, protected status that Salvadorians and Hondurans and Nicaraguans too uh, within this region had was canceled. Uh, it was uh, contested in court, but also very recently um, they lost in court. And so the, the program, if nothing happens, will expire in January 2021. So that's a major concern because it is around 250,000 migrants from, from those countries and also Haiti and Sudan. So during the Trump administration also, uh, we, we saw more raids uh, in states, especially in sanctuary cities, cities that decided not to collaborate with immigration and, and authorities. Uh, I, I, uh, also the parents, of, at the beginning of the administration, the parents who brought children were criminalized. Then the definition of the asylum system was changed and important things for in, within this system that were used by Central Americans, the notion of domestic abuse and bi violence could not be used anymore uh, as a reason for asylum. Then uh, the, to, to qualify for asylum, you had to cross from a specific po uh, of official po ports of entry at the border. Then that was stopped. And we had the MPP that has been mentioned already, migration protocols, which is wait in Mexico. So migrants had to wait in Mexico. And now after COVID, people who are waiting to the asylum process in, in Mexico, uh, are still there because the, the, the doors are closed right now. So they, they have to wait over there. So also uh, the, the US push, uh, the, I mean, uh, Mexico to control its southern border. This is important to mention because it is important to just to put some context that Mexico actually had passed an immigration law in 2011 and was moving towards a rights-based approach but it has been a contradiction for Mexico, but while Mexico was trying to protect human rights, at least for, as a constitutional mandate, it, it had to, to face the issue of the US pressure with during the Trump administration, really put Mexico in a very difficult situation, having to control migration through the southern border. And Mexico actually has played a very crucial role in, in stopping the flows. And also there are these third uh, country agreements with El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala, which are also important to remember, they haven't properly started yet. Uh, they, there are agreements that were signed, which uh, uh, commits those countries to become refugee countries. If a person on his way to the US has passed through that country, the US can send that person back to those countries. And so they have to apply for asylum there first. So I just wanted to put all this context because all of this is, is at play right now, I would say. So, just wanted very fast because I don't want to take much time to say that all this cumulative effect of all these policies over time had already created a very complex situation for all the countries involved. Uh, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico, and the US. Why? Because in all of these countries, it has created a broken families, binational families with mul multiple legal statuses and the various partner situations because when migrants have to settle longer because they can't go back, back and forth, they, they establish new partners. So now they have one family here, one family in their country of origin. That creates abandonment in the country of origin of children. So we have a lot of communities where the parents are not present or 
the parents are deported and, they, and but the children that were born in the US either stay uh, alone in the US or in the foster care system or when they are brought back to Mexico or the other countries, they are uprooted. So that's a, a big problem. And, and so all of that has major consequences for, for development for all of the countries involved, including the US, because the number of deportations have been so, so high that it has impacted a lot of the future generation of the US. So I wanted to just put all these variables because I don't want to take more, more, effect, more time. I just want to say about the US election. Obviously, if Trump wins, we can see an increase of the humanitarian crisis and more violations of human rights, because it is very hard to see how uh, uh, the, the, the Trump administration move, would move to, to, to another approach. For instance, uh, we could see the end of the asylum system as we know it. Uh, we, we probably will see, in my view, fewer flows overall. Uh, or they would be, we would have more deportations because now they, they, we, they will be able to deport anybody that has been two years or less in the US. So that will increase the number of deportations, I think. It will consolidate a lot of the, the, the policies that the Trump administration has implemented in, on migration. Also, Mexico will keep playing a major role uh, as a, the containing the flows for the US with huge human rights violations in Mexico because Mexico does not have the capacity to, to, to respond to this amount of, of, of flows and keep that people in Mexico and uh, increase human rights violations in all the countries involved. I think with a Biden administration, um, I, the, big, the big question is, can we expect the Biden administration to go back to the Obama era policies? And I would say that, first of all, with a favorable Senate, and this could be either having the Senate Democrat or it could be also having Republicans, because I think a lot of Republicans might be willing to negotiate on migration uh, for, for an immigration reform uh, for what has happened. And so maybe there could be a bipartisan bill that may allow for some path to citizenship that at least, uh, depending on how the bill comes about, may allow for, uh, to be for specific groups, the DACA and DAPA of the Obama era, and maybe the TPS, as, uh, the, the Salvadorians and Hondurans that have the temporary protected status. A big question is if we are gonna see guest worker agreements, um, because that has been a big call uh, in, in the region, maybe, but it will depend what role unions play in all of this and the, the pressures within the Democratic Party. But there's, there's also an understanding. Sorry, I understand. So anyway, so also I think uh, there may be a canceling of MPP, uh, but maybe not during the pandemic. So that's the other thing to consider. The restoration of the asylum seeker, uh, system. And anyway, I just leave all this open, the rest for questions and answers. But I hope that helps to kind of bring us a little on, on what will happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, let me now turn the mic to Andrew. Hello there. Good morning. Good to be with you. Um, let me uh, run through. I'm going to talk about policy in the region. I'm going to try and cover a lot of terrain in seven minutes. Let's see if we can do this. Um, you've already heard the sort of the, I, I, I think, the key elements of what's changed around the hemisphere. You know, we've seen flows within the region to a degree that we haven't seen in modern history. The narrative if we were talking about migration 10 or 15 years ago was about Mexicans coming to the United States. As Catherine points out, that's no longer the case. You know, there's probably a net outflow of, in fact, there is a net outflow of Mexicans back to Mexico rather than coming to the United States. Mexicans still come to the US, but there are more that return to, to Mexico than come to the United States. Um, and the largest flowers of Venezuelans who have primarily settled, some are coming to the U.S., but small numbers have come to the U.S. compared to the numbers that have settled almost in every other country of Latin America, as well as Nicaraguans who've moved to Costa Rica, 100, 120,000 since 2018 because of repression in that country, Cubans and Haitians um, who ha have moved various places, often trying to get to the U.S., but not always. Haitians settled in Brazil and then moved on to Chile and Ecuador. And then some have tried to make their way up to the United States, but some are still, um, there's a Haitian community that's very stable in Mexico and growing slightly. There are Haitian communities in Chile and Ecuador and Brazil. 
Um, there are Cuban communities in various parts of the region as well. Um, so there's a lot going on in terms of migration within Latin America. Now, I, I would say there's sort of two subsystems you can talk about. There's a subsystem that's sort of Costa Rica on down that has very little to do with the United States. The United States plays a role here and there um, in terms of foreign policy and, and in some aid for governments to do things, but it is not a major policy player. And then you have an area that, that runs from sort of Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico, north, which is very much in the US orbit. So I'm gonna speak about those separately because they have different dynamics. One very tied to the election next week, which Miriam was just talking about, um, but the other, and you know, very much in what Tracy was talking about in terms of, of what happens at the US-Mexico border, but the other is somewhat detached from that. So the first subsystem, let me say, I mean, you know, it, so if we'd had this conversation 10 or 15 years, we'd have been talking about, you know, Mexicans coming to the US, we would have been talked, we would have talked about Peruvians and Ecuadorians, by the way, heading to Spain and to the United States. We would have been talked, you know, we would have talked about Central Americans coming to the US as well, although in very small numbers um, at that time. This is now a different panorama. Then people started to go home as with Mexicans, as happened with Peruvians and Colombians and Ecuadorians, there started to be a flow back. And now we really have this interregional system. So, or two, inter, you know, two, two systems going on. So the first system, Costa Rica on down to Argentina, um, you know, huge migration flows, 1.8 million in Colombia, a million in Peru, you know, between four and 500,000 in Ecuador and Chile. Um, 250,000 or so in Brazil, 150,000 or more actually, 180,000 in Argentina, large numbers of Venezuelans and larger percentages in some of the countries of the Caribbean. I mean, Trinidad and Tobago, Aruba, Curaçao, for example, Dominican Republic, percentage wise, I mean, smaller numbers, but given the size of those, of those islands, of, of those island nations, they, they have a much higher percentage of inflow. Um, of Venezuelans coming in. And, and again, I mean, Nicaraguans to Costa Rica, 100, 120,000, doesn't sound like much, but it's 2% of Costa Rica's population. So it's, that's a lot in two years. Um, countries, I can tell you two different stories. Story one is that the countries in the region have been very innovative. They've been very generous. They have tried often to find legal status for people. Um, some countries have used labor mobility agreements as in the case of Argentina and Brazil. Others have created general amnesties, regularization programs for Venezuelans um, who've come in, Colombia, Peru, uh, massive regularization programs, Ecuador more recently. Um, others have used their asylum system as Brazil has. Mexico has actually for Venezuelans been very generous on asylum um, procedures. Costa Rica has used its asylum system, not always to give asylum, but it takes so long to go through the Costa Rican asylum system, you de facto get a work permit and the right to stay while your case is going through. Um, so it's become a de facto legalization. So one story is incredible generosity, incredible ability to reach out and receive people. And it's true. And I, I wrote a, a with uh, Miriam actually and I and a couple other colleagues wrote a piece about Latin American innovation in, in migration, which I still stand by. I think it's very much one part of the story. But there's a second part of the story, which is which is, you know, how difficult it is for people to integrate into societies in Latin America. And the fact that, you know, as Catherine talked about, COVID is beginning to change the dynamics as well um, and make people more skeptical about migration. And so, you know, the truth is also, if you're Venezuela and Colombia, it's harder to get legalized today than it was two years ago. There's more skepticism. Peru just did a legalization this last week, but they did a much more limited legalization than in the past. You know, people aren't doing these big legalization programs anymore. It's harder to get legal status. It's hard to get a bank account in a country you arrive in. A lot of Venezuelans ran businesses. Suddenly they're starting all over in Peru and they can't get a bank account, right? Much less credit. Um, hard to get housing, hard to get into the labor market, hard to get recognized in your chosen profession. This has been a very educated group of flow coming from Venezuela, particularly those that get beyond Colombia, you know, are very likely to have uh, technical or higher education degrees, very hard to get recognized as a doctor, an engineer, a teacher, a nurse, or anything else. So, you know, the, one story is, yes, incredible receptivity, also helps that the, the informal market is so big because people do tend to find jobs in the informal market. Other story is not very creative yet and not very institutionally robust in how to give people access to, to a dignified life. And, and countries have been really good on education with the exception of Trinidad and Tobago have been very good at allowing my, the children of migrants and migrant children to have access to education, but often hard to actually register. I mean, there are lots of bureaucratic hurdles 
you know, you can show up at school and they could say, well, did you bring your, your grades for the last three years? Not what most people bring with them when they're fleeing from Venezuela. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, de facto bur burdens on the ground, but let's say it's overall Latin America has been probably a, one of the more creative regions in the world, partially because it's new to these mass migration flows in trying to figure out how to manage it. There's a lot of creativity. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of thinking about it. And at the same time, there's a lack of institutional capacity and the beginnings of a backlash tied to COVID and just tied to the large numbers of people that have moved in, in countries that already had very fragile education systems, healthcare systems, you know, housing and, and labor, informal labor markets. Um, the story in the North is of course, much more tied to the United States. It's a story you've heard. It's a story Tracy told you about the border, which is where, you know, US policy has really determined what's happened. Even Mexico, as Miriam said, you know, shifted dramatically from being very open to migrants, really not thinking about migration you know, the 12, 2011 law was really about showing that Mexico was better to migrants than the U.S. was to Mexicans, but it wasn't really thought about receiving migrants, right? Mexico was not yet a migrant receiving country um, in a large scale. And uh, suddenly, so the initial reaction was, let's be open to people. And then realizing when the Trump administration started to clamp down on Mexico, saying, well, this is actually a policy area we can sacrifice and really closing down the border and, and replicating many of the things that the U.S. government has done. Um, as well as allowing Mexico to be used essentially to warehouse people as they're waiting for their immigration court cases in the U.S. system and in, in the MPP program. So, you know, Mexico has become very much a, 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 an extension of U.S. policy. What's possible in the future? We have an election next week, and with this I will end. What's possible in the future for the rest of Latin America? I think you have inertia around creativity and around trying to figure out what to do. And I think you have some, some pushback now um, about people skeptical about migration. And so th that will play out in different countries in different ways in, Latin, in the rest of Latin America, Costa Rica and South. What happens in Central America and Mexico next depends a lot on what happens in the US election. I there's gonna be enormous pressures as everyone has said in one way or another for people to migrate, especially from Central America. Um, you know, the, the economies are hit worse than the economies in the United States for many people. So it is, you know, these are much more fragile economies. People live much more closer to the bone. There's going to be pressures for people to migrate. And I think there are two visions playing out next week. I mean, one vision is we can control this by controlling our borders. An enforcement only approach works. It stops people from coming. If you don't give people access to asylum, they have no legal pathway in. We can just control. And if you force Mexico to to control its border and you force Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador to take people back, nationals of other countries back through these asylum um, cooperation agreements, ACAs that we've, the US government has signed with each of these governments, you know, you can manage migration that way. You just, it, you know, you hit it with a hard enough hammer and, and you know, it's not gonna happen. I'm, I'm pretty skeptical in addition to whatever, you know, sort of moral doubts we may have about that. I'm skeptical about it even as effective policy um, you've heard from others, I mean, the, the human cost of this, but I'm not sure that an enforcement only approach can actually hold. You know, it's sort of like building a sand castle. If anyone did this as a child or has children, you know, actually went to the beach recently, tried to do this with my children, you try and build sand castles and you try and stop the waves from coming in. It's not clear to me, I'm not sure that migrants should be compared to waves, so it's probably the wrong metaphor. But at the same time, there is something more powerful than the resistance we're putting up. It's not clear to me that an enforcement only approach is, is workable in the long term, right? Eventually people find their ways around whatever you've constructed. Um, and it becomes pretty nasty along the way to try and manage it. There is another approach and I don't think we know what a Biden administration would do, but I think there is another possibility um, with a Biden administration or with almost any other administration. I think almost any other Republican or Democratic, we would actually be talking with a different set of possibilities about how you manage migration. And it doesn't mean open borders because I don't think that's an option politically or, or substantively. But, ha you know, and I don't think you get away from some notion of border control, both at the U.S.-Mexico border and the Mexico-Guatemala border. But you can talk about how you begin to restore protection, how you begin to restore asylum in a more efficient and fair system. Um, it's going to take a little time to do that. We can talk about that in Q&A if you want, but there are ways you can make the asylum system work a lot better and be a lot fairer in the process. 
Um, and I mean, you largely do it by putting it final decisions in the hands of asylum officers, but we can talk about what that means later if you want. I think there's also ways we can think about protection closer to home, how we strengthen Mexico's asylum system, work with Mexico to take some people who are still in danger in Mexico to the United States, rather than leaving them in Mexico. We have something called the protection transfer agreement through Costa Rica, where we take a couple hundred people a year through Costa Rica um, who are in imminent danger in their home countries in Central America, we can actually plus that up. There's, there's a lot of things we could be doing in protection in addition to asylum, because the idea someone's got to go 2,000 miles to, to ask for asylum isn't ideal either. We should protect people close to where they live. We can do a lot more on labor pathways. Um, we have about 260,000 Mexicans who come every year as seasonal workers to the United States. We have about 6,000 Central Americans who come to the United States. Um, that is clearly a mismatch, right? I mean, we created a line for people to get into who want to work in the United States. If you're Mexican, we have not done it for Central Americans. In existing legislation, it's hard to do. We don't, we can't mandate it, but there are ways we can go about it. We can talk about that in Q&A if you want. And finally, there's a real case to be made for how we invest in the countries people are coming from, including, and with this I'll end, looking at how you use remittances to generate development. That is not easy. The easiest way of doing it, traditionally we thought remittances, you know, have people pool their remittances and they build roads and so on, which happens and it's great when it does. But there's also a question about how you get people to bank remittances. How do you give people credit versus their remittances? You know, how do you give people access to credit that allows them to turn remittances into investments and actually benefits the society as a whole and uses self-interest um, as a mechanism and just smart banking, smart things that actually benefit the financial sector as well as benefit migrants, that would be really good to try out. So thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. So let's now open the session to Q and A. You've had uh, four different presentations giving you a perspective on different angles of the phenomenon. I thought the presentations complemented each other actually quite well. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask the audience to um, start uh, posing questions. You can do that in the Q&A function of your screen at the bottom. Uh, please identify yourselves and also say if you want someone in particular to answer your question. Um, so you, you can do that. I'll read the question out loud to the, to the panelists. And so while we get started uh, with, with well, we wait for the audience to um, ask questions. I um, I had a question that actually uh, follows on this observation that you uh, made, Andrew, about the possible the illusion of enforcement only approach and and um, the idea that this seems really. Um, failed uh, or, or in some ways uh, designed, not designed, but, but uh, that, that it really can't accomplish its own objectives uh, for all the reasons that you mentioned. And so here, I want to go back to the, um, to the trajectory of the US policy that uh, Miriam mentioned, where there was this moment that, that, that that's a story that's been told, but the, the moment of, further enforcement of uh, controls at the US border that I think really also were very um, heightened during the Clinton administration. You saw that some of the numbers of the increase in US border patrol and uh, you know a lot of equipment and so forth. And what happened was something very counterintuitive perhaps for people who are not familiar with this phenomenon, which is that as you ramped up enforcement controls, a lot of people started to stay in the United States rather than go back, right? So that all these informal circuits and seasonal circuits of migration were interrupted. And as a result, a very paradoxical result is that, you know, the more enforcement controls that you put in place, the greater the numbers of migrants who actually stayed in the US for fears that they couldn't, you know, if they returned, they couldn't come back and, and all of that. And so the insight of that result, I think I wanted to just basically pick it up uh, for what you just said a moment ago. So if enforcement only approach doesn't work, what can we recover from those immigration policies and perhaps informal phenomena that happened before 
the enforcement was ramped up. To have policies that are now formal and legal, but that could kind of uh, built on that idea that you know, if you have more fluid controls, if you have perhaps temporary approaches, you mentioned some of those, but I wanted to see if there's something more we can develop, basically going along that line, drawing from this insight that is quite paradoxical, but very powerful. Sure, you want me to jump in, Alvaro, on yes, this? Yes, okay. Please. Yeah, I think the, the way you have to do it, and look, I, there is no panacea. I mean, look, uh, my, migration management is, you know, I think it's ultimately about, you know, how do you decide who comes into the country? How do you set some boundaries and enforce those boundaries? And then how do you try and convert, you know, unauthorized flows into authorized flows, right? I mean, so you try and convert some people who, who are going to come one way or another, they're going to at least try and come one way or another, give them another option here, right? I mean, I, I think there is a lot of truth about people having stayed with increased border enforcement. The other thing that happened, of course, in the 90s is there just got to be a critical mass of people who had family in the United States, right? And, you know, both are true. People stayed because it was harder to go back and forth, but they also stayed because family networks were more developed communities were more developed. By the way, some of this is happening in Mexico now. I mean, not only Haitians in Tijuana, but Cubans in Juarez, Venezuelans in Monterrey. You know, you start to have everyone in Quintana Roo. You start to have, you know, these small nucleus of communities. And it's going to be very interesting. I mean, just from a, you know, an academic perspective, it's been very interesting to see if people actually begin to stay, if this begins to dr drive people who have family networks to some of these places. So I think some of that's going to happen anyway. But I think the lesson, Alvaro, from, from the period is, if you can figure out a way of creating legal channels for people to come and go, um, it is a, it, many people don't want to live in the United States. Many people want, they want, you know, some people do, some people are fleeing for their lives, right? I mean, some people really are trying to get out of Honduras, right? But, but many people are, are trying to just make some money. Or even if they're partially fleeing for their lives, there's, there's a set of people who probably quite, don't quite get asylum, but they are fleeing. For, you know, they're trying to get their kids out of a gang-ridden neighborhood. If they have a way of earning dollars, they also have ways of changing their circumstances, right? I mean, you, they're empowered then to make choices about where they live. So in many ways, creating legal channels allows people to have the kind of income without having to move to the United States and to come and go, and often to do it for a period of time. They often don't do it forever. They often do it during a period of time during which they earn enough money that they're then able to accomplish whatever their dreams are, change neighborhoods, start a small store, you know, make some investments in their farm. I, I had a friend in Mexico, actually, a good coworker and good friend of mine who had been a migrant as, as a, as in his younger days. And we both worked with migrants in Tijuana at the time, but he, he, um, he actually, you know, his family's rule was whenever, you know, the next boy's turn was up in the family, they were the one that migrated and the family would always set a target about what they were going to buy with the money, right? I mean, this was very utilitarian. They, none of them wanted to move to the U.S. They were all going, this is in the 80s, they were all going to, in the early 90s, they were all going to the U.S. for some, to get something. Most people have that, right? I mean, you know, they don't want to live in the U.S. Create those opportunities. The problem with this is our temporary work programs, H2A and H2B, H2A for agricultural workers, H2B for non-agricultural workers are entirely employer driven. And so there's no way to mandate recruiting in Central America. What you can do is create incentives. Um, you can create a cap above the H2B limit that is mandated to be recruited in Central America. That's one option. Um, H2A is unlimited, so there's no way of mandating it, but you can make it easy for people to recruit in South America, in Central America. You know, you can strike agreements with the government, you can create transparency around recruiting, you can, um, you know, possibly create some ways that people get, you know, at least credit from the government, maybe not official monetary credit, but, you know, they look good if they start to help build a pipeline in Central America. And you can eventually change the temporary worker programs and make them much better programs. And there's some inertia to do that around agriculture, um, where there's agreements between farm, semi-agreements between farm workers and, and growers about how to reform the program. And so a new administration could try and push on that and maybe add some quotas for Central Americans. So I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. So. Um, Questions are starting to come in, and so let me read the first one by uh, Diego Agnes, who will be an LLM student at Georgetown, and he'd like the opinion of the panelists regarding the perception 
of the Venezuelan di diaspora, do you believe that countries throughout the Americas will create new policies regarding Venezuelan refugees, or will they take further action in order to help solve the Venezuelan crisis? So who, who would like to answer that question? I like to answer it. All right, go ahead. Well, no, I mean, I think Andrew spoke about that, but I also have, have work on those issues. I think an important thing to mention about, I think all of the region, which, which is probably uh, not understood, uh, is that all these countries change their constitutions. Uh, all of Latin American countries change the, the constitutions uh, within the span of two decades, which m means that they have, they, they turn international uh, law standards, the, the international human rights laws, their national laws. I mean, they, they put clauses in their constitutions. And so those are very important because the reason why we see the responses that we've seen in all of these countries is because they are somehow constitutionally mandated because the international standards are very specific and I could mention all of those. So what happens in, in all of Latin America with the Venezuelans in particular, is that they will face these contradictions between, on the other hand, they will start having uh, pushes to, to probably close the borders and also to, to stop migration because there is more xenophobia. But on the other hand, and I think that's one of the things that has guided the countries of, of the region. Colombia, even though Colombia is just uh, negotiating a new law right now, which also it will include, I mean, the, the constitution already included and in 1991, and a lot of the decisions in Colombia have gone through the judiciary process, which has forced the Colombian state to, in some ways to respond the way it has responded. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, there is the creativity that Andrew mentions, which is the, the permits, but that creativity comes because they have to, to, to do it in, in a way that keeps the international standards. Uh, so that's a, a, a trend in the region. So I think they will face this tension between having to deal with the legal systems if they want to, to, to stop providing permits, if they want to close their borders, this will go to the judiciaries and there is a litigation now, a, a strategic litigation is because there is now an empowered civil society also that contests everything uh, in the courts in Latin America. So that's an important thing to consider. So just wanted to mention that there is gonna be these tensions between the legal systems and the pressures to close, because I think the pressures to close will be there in the context of the pandemic, the economic crisis, populations that may turn more xenophobic, yet the governments are also tied from a legal perspective. So I think that's an important thing to, to consider. I, I'm actually a little more skeptical about that. I, I don't think the courts have played much of a role except around the margins, and I don't think they will. I, they, they played a role in access to healthcare in Colombia and a few things, but but my sense is that they, I mean, you've seen a slowdown in providing uh, legal documents. Um, I'm not sure it's going to pick up again, except in in occasional and creative ways. Like I think you will see the Colombian government eventually provide legal status to high school students. Um, and once they provide it to high school students, it becomes a roundabout way to give it to other people. Peru has started to do that very quietly as well. Um, and so you're gonna see these ways that don't get public attention popping up. Um, and, and you know, oddly enough, in different countries, there are different champions for this. I mean, I, you know, the different champions in, it's, it's often you know, strange things like the finance ministry in Peru, which realizes that actually the Venezuelans have been good for the Peruvian economy. And so they're, they keep pushing things along with the migration agency. You know, in Colombia, it's been because of geopolitics and because they, you know, they want to stand tough to Maduro, the president of Venezuela. And so you can't really turn your back on Venezuelans. And so there's sort of a, you know, a play back and forth on this. And there's also, I mean, almost every single conversation I've ever been with a Colombian official, and, and Miriam's heard this too. I mean, we've both been in these conversations. It almost always ends, and we've worked together a lot of these things. I mean, it almost always ends with them saying, and we couldn't really stop people from coming in if we wanted to, right? I mean, there is this sort of sense of they know what we won't admit, which is, you know, they really can't stop you from coming in. The U.S. can, by the way. I mean, let me say, there's a difference. I mean, we can stop you from coming in. The question becomes, how much do you want to spend on this? What is your level of priority you give to this? If you're willing to spend infinite amounts, you can stop people from coming in. By the way, it's not actually the waves. I mean, but even if it is the waves. People have built, you know, people build dams. People build, you know, people build, you know, all sorts of structures to stop, um, 
the waves. It can be done. It just takes a lot of money, right? I mean, you know, it, 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 what are you willing to spend on this? My guess is we aren't willing to spend what it takes as a society to stop all people from coming in. Therefore, you know, because that's a ridiculous amount of money. And therefore, you know, what we should be doing thoughtfully is how do you manage people coming in, right? In a way that's also consistent with our values, in a way that that knows that some people are going to be coming in and that's okay. We need them anyway. I mean, this is good for us. Um, and, and, but set some limits, right? I mean, so it's that area of sort of thinking rationally about management and how you create legal pathways. For Colombia and Peru and Ecuador and Chile, there's even much less capacity to stop people. And they're not anywhere close to being able to stop people. So they have, they're going to have to figure out how to manage it. And it's actually been pretty good for the economies overall. So though there's some incentives. And if anyone is interested at four o'clock today, we actually have a group of six uh, Venezuelan migrant leaders um, speaking at an MPI um, event where we're actually talking about how migrant organizations are shaping this, because this goes to something Miriam said, um, which is really important, which is civil society is becoming increasingly important in these conversations. And one piece of that is actually Venezuelans themselves. This is a highly educated diaspora, highly politically engaged diaspora that left. And so a lot of them have turned their energy to actually trying to shape the policy landscape um, for being able to receive them. And I, and I agree with Miriam, that is a hugely important factor. Let me move to the next question. This is from uh, Aline Barros from Voice of America. Uh, and it's a question to everyone who, anyone who wants to answer it. So what policies, executive orders, rules, do you think a Biden administration will try to get rid of in the first few weeks? And on the other hand, what are the policies that you see a Biden administration having a more complex time dismantling and why? Catherine. I'm sure Tracy has something to say here uh, on this too, but um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation inside the Beltway. I'm sure we've all been in these conversations about <clears throat> if Biden wins, what will happen, <clears throat> at least in the very short term. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll speak to that directly and say people believe that, you know, there'll be at least some solution to to DACA that will at least be an immediate temporary solution to DACA, meaning continuing the program. Uh, there'll be a stoppage of the TPS order that now, as Miriam suggested, will lead to uh, the return of several hundred thousand people going back. Um, the, and, and, you know, and then there are other examples of this, but those two are certainly there. If, if Biden wins and the Senate wins. Maybe we could talk about some sort of uh, legislative reform, uh, you know, of some scale, but that wouldn't be immediate, right? That would still take time. Uh, you know, um, uh, my thinking is, is that that would be great. These short term fixes would be great. But as Miriam suggested, this is a powerful engine now. We have created an incarceration system for, you know, for immigrants. We have created an enforcement first system deal to manage immigrants that's well beyond a temporary fix here and there. Or even if it's not temporary, you know, permanent fixes here and there. Uh, so this is really worrying me um, to, uh, you know, to a great extent where I lose sleep over thinking about who's going to be left out if there are a series of temporary fixes. And there'll be a lot of families left out. And uh, because families will still be in the U.S. with mixed status. And even if, okay, there'll be a memo that says I shouldn't be focusing on deporting you know, fa uh, people who don't have criminal records, right? Like the last two years of the Obama administration. That's something that also probably will be likely to happen. But it will still mean that there'll be uh, a lot of people who's, uh, you know, who will still feel under threat. Uh, and so on the one hand, it's great. There will be some temporary fixes. On the other hand, there's this huge system out there that needs really um, to be considered and looked at carefully and reformed. Now, how does that happen? Let me just say the one thing I didn't hear Andrew say uh, is, and I'm, I'm really eager to do this myself, but I can't do it alone, is to understand how it is 
that Customs and Border Protection spends its money? And how, you know, can we think about how it's spent its money in the past? Yes, we can probably get some information about that. If Biden was in, we could probably get more information about that. But then how could we reform that spending? Uh, now, Andrew, you mentioned, you know, we could reform that spending in different ways. Um, you said what we could do is protect people, you know, and, and open up our system in different ways and provide some channels that don't exist now with legal status. That's all fine. But at the same time, Customs and Border Protection has an enormous budget. And some of those things that you discussed don't even fall within their budget. So, you know, can we really as a country look honestly at, um, at the amount of money that fuels this enforcement first system? And can we say, you know, okay, maybe that amount of money should continue, but maybe we should be thinking more strategically about how that money gets spent and where. And that's, um, you know, that's a big question, but there's certainly a number of people, we have the skill set to be able to do that kind of analysis. And I would really hope that for the future, for long-term change, that kind of analysis could be part of it. Thank you, Catherine. I want to uh, give uh, Tracy an opportunity to jump in also if you want, Tracy. Sure. Um, I think one of the, the things that maybe the only positive thing about seeing the Trump administration um, abuse its powers is that some of the things that have been implemented are by executive order. So that means they might be a little easier to undo. So we've heard the Biden administration, the Biden team say that that they would end MPP, the Remain in Mexico policy, um, you know, within the first hundred days. That's been a priority they've highlighted several times, which we're very excited about. Um, something that might be harder to dismantle would be asylum metering, for example, which has been going on now um, since uh, spring of 2018. Um, and, and so I think, you know, part of that is the question that you kind of raised, Kathy, of does the infrastructure exist? Has the infrastructure been dismantled so much in these protective humane sources, ways of processing folks that it'll take more time? So I think one of the big questions we've been asking is, um, you know, as migrants are making plans and saying, well, when will the border open and when will I actually get processed? You know, even if there is a transition in January, we don't know how long it'll take to have the infrastructure in place to be able to process. Since now we have, you know, thousands of families that are here waiting under MPP, if that's the first priority, um, then the folks who are waiting under metering then would have longer to wait. Um, the other concern has been, you know, we're, we're very aware that the Biden administration is concerned about optics. And so we've seen a pattern in the past. I think it was under the Clinton administration where they made some promises to migrants um, about having relief right away and then had this rush of folks showing up at, at our borders. And because of those optics, reverse their position. And so one of the things that that we're really pushing for is to start the planning now and start putting things in place um, in case there would be the possibility to be able to process lots of people who are already waiting. So I think you know there's there's some optimism, but at the same time the reality that um, that the system has um, the infrastructure has been shifted so much that we just don't have the resources really needed to do things well, um, but also wanting people to be able to be processed really quickly and happy to collaborate in whatever way we can to make that happen. I, I think that's, if I can jump in other, I think that is what Tracy says is, is gonna be an important question. I mean, that is, you know, the priorities, which is, I mean, do you try and sort of restart the asylum system for everyone? Do you prioritize MPP first? Maybe deal with those who are waiting for metering second? I mean, the danger is if you sort of eliminate the CDC order, which is in place, and you allow everyone to start coming, you may actually get overwhelmed at the border, right? I mean, so the, there are other, I think the thing that they've got to be thinking about right now is, you know, do you try and rebuild the asylum system so it's actually ready to road run um, when you open up the border again and you start processing people in MPP and maybe metering next? You know, you start bringing in people who are, who have been waiting for a long time and you send the message, look, we will open up the border, but not now. Don't come now because, you know, you are, the expulsion is still there. May or may not work, but I think that that is one of the questions. I mean, there, there's a, the history, the, the, a colleague of mine always tells the story of the, the boats from 
from Haiti that were waiting. You know, Clinton said he would allow Haitian boats to dock in the U.S. as soon as he was president. There were three boats waiting during the transition period, and they immediately came out and said, you know, whoops, <laughs> we're not actually going to let boats land, right? I mean, as soon as they realized that was coming, they, they changed position. I suspect that that would just, no matter what they say now or even think now, I mean, you know, Biden may be thinking, you know, I'm going to get rid of expulsions in MPP and the ACAs on day one. My guess is by the time they're actually looking at reality, they're going to have to figure out how you sequence things, which doesn't mean you don't do all of those things. It just means you think in what order you actually do those things, which I think matters. Um, to Catherine's point, um, I think re reforming DHS is a huge issue. DHS has been, Department of Homeland Security has been completely manoseado in Spanish. So wh whatever that is, manipulated, misused, exactly. um, it has become, you know, yeah. I mean, it has been just um, abused in the last, in, in ways that I never but thought was possible because it really is an outstanding- Allowed to run itself almost. I mean- Allowed to run itself, but not even because I would say, you know, there's some good people at DHS who've oh, also been run over. I mean, I've, I've seen cases of people who just surprised me. I mean, the professionals at DHS, are not the ones running the show. This has been politically used in ways that I, you know, that that is shocking sometimes. And I I think there is a question about how you begin to rebuild that. Um, I think most of the things around labor pathways and and protection have to be done by USCIS. I wouldn't put them in the hands of CBP. But I do think that there's a question about how you do detention at the border, who gets detained. You know, if you can build a, an efficient asylum system, you really don't need to detain most people. You can use case management. You can use much lesser forms of 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 um, put people in much less restrictive forms um, of of management um, than we currently do, and save a lot of money in the process. So I, I think you know we have to do about that. And then the last thing, to Catherine's point, I think DACA is going to be first on their list. Um, TPS hopefully goes with that. Salvadorans have a reprieve until October, but even so, that clock is ticking. Um, and uh, actually, they haven't even started. They haven't quite started the clock. They have to start the clock on this. So, so right now, there's still a little bit of time before TPS expires. It's probably March for everyone but Salvadorans, and October for Salvadorans. We think, um, but it, but it's soon. I mean, it's soon in the span of people who have to plan their lives and whether they could be deported. So that has to be early with DACA. At least try and give people security. They're not going to be sent back, and then maybe do a legislative fix. And if they're ambitious, I mean, you could start thinking about how do you move the registry date up? There's a registry date that says if you've been here since 19, I believe 72, you can legalize your status in the US. Of course, there's no one left to do that anymore. If you move that up to 2000 or 2010, however, you suddenly give people a chance, you know, a large number of people a chance to legalize their status. If you get rid of the bar for people who are married, a lot of people have three and five year um, uh, bars from being deported and they're married to US citizens or US residents. And so they cannot, even though they normally would be able to become, to apply for residency, they can't do that because of the bar. You can get rid of that rule. You can get rid of the bar for people married to, because these are people with American families, right? They have an American spouse. They have, you know, usually American children. You know, that's, that's a lot. That's about 1.3 million people. You can start adding in a bunch of these things actually very quickly and begin, you know, if you can't do 11 million, how do you begin looking at DACA plus, right? I mean, DACA plus TPS plus, you know, and maybe you don't do it all at once. Maybe things come in other bills, right? I mean, you, you know, you look at the registry date while you're talking about economic recovery, you know, you, you, you know, you begin thinking about these things. And finally, I think the thing also is, is, is enforcement. There'll be a lot of discussion, I think, early on about, you know, interior enforcement. I mean, there's, there's a huge question right now the Trump administration, they haven't actually deported a lot of people, but they've made it very discretional. I think there'll be an attempt to go back to the end of the Obama administration where there's at least a, you know, clear criteria going after criminals first in the in the detention and deportation proceedings. You know, and that, that's going to take some work because for reasons of DHS, I mean, I think there's been broad guidance to narrow that again is going to be hard, but I think that'll be an attempt, you know, to put that in policy. Let me jump in here. To jump in really quick, I think to address that that comment about um, concerns sure. with COVID and the CDC order, I think we have to be really honest that this conversation about non-essential travel um, is absolutely a pretext. So I can't tell you the number of times I've personally crossed the border and told an agent, I'm going to go hiking in the woods. And no question, like, oh, sure, go ahead. So it's 
it absolutely is not, does not have to do with our fears about COVID. We have ways to process people safely. So I, I just want to like reiterate um, that, yes, of course, that concerns there. We need to figure out how to deal with it. And that's also not really a core reason why they're not processing people. I, I wanted to add also, just in relation to Mexico and Central America, it's interesting what the Biden, or if there is a Biden administration will do. Like Mexico has been playing a major role in controlling the flows for the US. So the question is, is a Biden administration going to keep exercising pressure on Mexico to keep controlling in the southern border of Mexico? I think that's a very important question. And I, I believe, but maybe I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, that uh, a Biden administration would be cautious about uh, that in the, in the sense that it is important for the US that Mexico keeps controlling the flows now that it has shown that it is effective. And so I think maybe there he will be more cautious also because we should not forget that a lot of his electorate will be working class whites if they elect him. So he'll be cautious about that electorate. So that's, I think the pressure will continue over Mexico. The interesting thing there is if the US will help Mexico and Central America build the refugee systems and become more effective at controlling the, the flows. And I think that's where we could see a change, building more capacity and dealing more with the human rights violations because I think that's a, an important topic. I just thought it's interesting to mention that. Sure, thank you. Let me quickly move to the last question. This is by Alondra Saldivar, who is an aspiring immigration attorney from California. Um, and she was interested in the brief mention of labor pathways and is wondering how that may look in regards to the complicated connections the Northern Triangle, Mexico and the US already have. Do you all think that that would be sustainable? So who, who would like to take a stab at uh, answering this question? I mean, I, I mean, yes, go ahead, Catherine. Well, I'm, I was just going to say the U.S. has, uh, Andrew, I'll, I'll let you pick up the back end of this, but the U.S. has a history of, uh, you know, in the mid 20th century, 22 years worth of uh, Bracero programs, um, you know, with Mexico. And it was a very, yes, there were, you know, issues, of course, but it was a fairly predictable and led to a lot of that circular migration, Alvaro, that you were talking about that was sort of um, in place by the in the second half of the 20th century. So um, there are certainly ways to do this. This I don't think is rocket science. We have to carefully do it. But I think that there are ways for the U.S. to reach out to countries, um, uh, you know, in the Northern Triangle to make something like this happen. Andrew? Andrew? Yeah, I just agree with Catherine on that. I mean, I think that's right. And, and I, I think the um, uh, we can do it. It's not a panacea. It doesn't mean people won't come illegally. I mean, that happened with, with the Bracero program. You know, increasingly there was more demand than the Bracero program could do. It doesn't mean we shouldn't fix these programs. I mean, there were a lot of downsides of the Bracero program. There's downsides of H2As and H2Bs now. You know, you can implement this with labor rights or without it, right? I mean, a lot of it depends kind of what, the administration pays attention to. Um, there are groups in Mexico doing great work to try and, and hold recruiters accountable. There's a lot of, of unethical and legal recruiting practices that go on in Mexico right now for H2As and H2Bs. The great civil society groups trying to track this and, and hold you know, growers accountable and employers accountable for not using unethical and, and illegal recruiters. Um, but it doesn't work very well because the administration isn't paying attention to this. So administration could do this, you could improve the program legally. I think there are lots of ways of doing it. Um, it would it stop people from wanting to come through regular routes? No, I, I think there'll still be people who, you know, can't figure out how to get into the program, can't navigate it. Um, you know, it's too slow. It's not what they, they want to actually live in the United States because their, you know, parents are already in the U.S. or their, you know, siblings are in the U.S. So it's not a panacea. But it'd be a lot better giving people a, a line to get into and an actual opportunity to come legally. You know, you start taking some people out of the, you start taking some of the pressure off of people, um, you know, choosing to go the only way they can, which right now is illegally. All right. So 
Uh, we've reached the end of our session. I want to thank uh, Catherine, Tracy, Andrew, and Miriam for joining us today. Uh, this was a fabulous conversation. I really uh, enjoyed it and found it very illuminating. I also want to invite you back, uh, perhaps in the spring, once we know uh, what the result of the election was, and to take stock of uh, what the situation looks like, how COVID-19 and the economic crisis uh, looks like then and, and think about uh, so the, the continuation of this conversation, um, uh, thinking about all these policies and programs that you, that you mentioned. So you have a standing invitation to join us back. We'll organize something uh, sometime in the spring. Um, I also want to remind our audience that we have a uh, session on Thursday, a career paths session on uh, immigration law and policy. We'll be joined by four great uh, lawyers uh, and policy analysts working on this uh, in this field. So uh, I encourage you all to join us on Thursday. And thank you again to our speakers. Um, this has been great. Uh, have a good day. <laughs>